Chapter 23. Luke let the kitchen door slam behind him and didn't care. He was so mad, his eyes blurred. The nerve of her saying, I don't have time for you. Who did she think she was? He tramped up the stairs. She'd always thought she was better than him, just because she was a baron, showing him, showing off with her soda and her potato chips and her fancy computer. So what? It didn't mean she was special, just because her parents had lots of money. It wasn't like she'd earned it or anything. Who was she, anyway? Just some dumb old girl. He wished she'd never gone over there. All she did was brag, 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 and show off. That's all the rally was, anyhow, showing off. Hey, look, I'm a third child, and I can go to the president's house, and nobody will hurt me. He hoped someone shot her. That would show her. Luke stopped in the middle of pulling the attic door shut behind him. No, no. He took it back. He didn't want anyone to shoot her. His knees went weak, and he had to sit down on the stairs. All his anger suddenly turned to fear. What if someone did shoot her? He remembered the sign she'd asked if he wanted to carry. Give me liberty or give me death. Was she serious? Did she expect to? He stopped himself from thinking the rest. What if she never came back? He should go, if only for t to protect Jen. But he couldn't. Luke buried his face in his hands, trying to hide from his own thoughts. Mother found him there, hours later, still crouched on the stairs. Luke, were you getting impatient waiting for me to come home? Did you have a nice day? Luke stared at her as though she were a vision from another life. I, he started, ready to spill everything. He couldn't hold it all in. Mother felt his forehead. Are you sick? You're so pale, I worry about you, Luke, all day long, but then I remind myself you're safe here at home, out of harm's way. She gave him a weary smile and ruffled his hair. Luke swallowed hard and recovered himself. What was he thinking? He couldn't tell anyone about Jen. He couldn't betray her. I'm fine, he lied. I just haven't been out in the sun for a while, remember? Not, sh not that I'm complaining, of course, he added hastily, hiding again. Chapter 24. For three days, Luke agonized. Sometimes he decided he had to stop Jen to persuade her not to go. Sometimes he decided to, he ought to go with her. Sometimes he was mad again and thought he should just stalk over there and demand an apology. But anything he might do required seeing Jen, and that wasn't possible. It poured every day, the rain coming down in long, dreary sheets that made Luke feel worse as he watched from the attic vents. Downstairs, he could hear Dad stomping around, muttering every now and then about this time, about the time and topsoil being lost. With every raindrop, Luke felt like a prisoner. Thursday night, he went to bed convinced he'd never be able to sleep for imagining Jen and the others in her car getting farther and farther from him and closer and closer to danger. But he must have dozed off because he woke to total darkness. His heart pounded. He was sweaty. Had he dreamed something? Had he heard something? A floorboard creaked. His ears roared as he tried to listen. Was that someone else's breath or just his own? Loud and scared, a beam of light swept across his face. Luke! A whisper. Luke bolted up in bed. Jen, is that you? She switched off her flashlight. Yes, I thought I'd kill myself coming up your stairs. Why didn't you tell me they were so narrow? She sounded like the same old Jen, not mad, not crazy. I didn't think you'd ever be climbing them, Luke said. It was insane to be talking about stairs now in the middle of the night in his rooms. Every word either of them spoke was dangerous. Mother was a light sleeper, but Luke was delighted not to be moving on not to be talking about what Jen had really come to talk about. Your parents don't, didn't lock your doors, Jen said. She seemed to be stalling too. Guess I'm lucky the government outlawed pets. Didn't farmers always used to keep big guard dogs that would chomp people's heads off in one bite? Luke shrugged, then remembered Jen couldn't see him in the dark. Jen, I, I, he wasn't sure what he was going to say until he said it. I still can't go, I'm sorry. It's something about having parents who are farmers, not lawyers, and not being a baron. It's people like you who change history. People like me, we just let things happen to us. No, you're wrong. You can make things happen. Luke sensed, rather than saw, Jen was shaking her head. 
Even in the dark, he could visualize each precisely cut strand of hair bouncing and falling back into place. I'm sorry. I didn't come here to harp at you. This is dangerous, and no one should go in willingly. I was too hard on you the other day. I just wanted to say you've been a good friend. I'll miss you. But you'll be back, Luke said. Tomorrow or the next day after the rally, I'll be over to visit. If your rally works, I'll be walking in the front door. We can help, Jen said softly. Her voice faded away. Goodbye, Luke. Chapter 25. Luke lay awake the rest of the night. At first light, he got up and quietly scrubbed away the mud Jen had tracked in and up the stairs. Trust her not to think about mud. He fervently hoped she thought of all the details about the rally. Luke was just finishing the last of the kitchen floor when he heard the toilet flushing upstairs. He hid the muddy rags in the trash and scrambled back to his place on the stairs just in time to meet Mother coming down. Morning, early bird. Were you up during the night? I thought I heard something. I had trouble sleeping. I had trouble sleeping, Luke said truthfully. Mother yawned again. And you're up early, feeling okay? Just hungry, Luke said. But he picked at his food. Everything he ate stuck in his throat. After the rest of his family left, he risked sneaking over and turning on the radio on low. There were weather reports and commercials for soybean seed and lots of music. Come on, come on, he muttered, keeping one eye on the, on the sideshow on the side window, watching for Dad. Finally, the radio voice announced the news. Someone's cattle had gotten out and caused a minor car wreck. Nobody hurt. A government spokesman predicted a poor planting season because of all the rain. Nothing about the rally. Dad came back toward the house. Luke snapped off the radio and bolted for the stairs. At lunch, Dad forgot to turn the radio on and Luke had to remind him. The announcer promised a big story after the commercials. His sandwich gone, Dad reached over to turn the radio off. No, wait! This might be interesting, Luke said. Dad harumphed, but waited. The announcer came back. He cleared his throat and declared that new government statistics proved last year's alfalfa harvest had set a record for the decade. It was like that for days. Luke kept waiting, desperate to hear anything. But the few times he could get to the radio, it said nothing. Every time Dad left the house for any length of time, Luke switched on the light by the back door, his old signal to Jen. He stared so hard, willing her answering light to go on, that he thought he would go blind. But there was nothing. He took to watching her house as obsessively as he had when he had first discovered her existence. There was no sign of her. The rest of her family came and went as usual. Did they look sadder? Happy? Worried? At peace? From a distance he couldn't tell. He got so desperate he asked Mother if she thought about going over to visit the new neighbors to welcome them to the area. She looked at him as if he were deranged. They've been there for months. They're hardly new anymore, and they're barons, she said. She laughed in a way that didn't hide her bitterness. Believe me, they don't want us visiting. And that was what she, and, and what was she supposed to say? Nice to meet you? Now tell me everything about the child you never talk about. After a week, Luke did feel deranged. Every time anyone spoke to him, he jumped. Mother asked him, are you all right? So many times he took to avoiding her, but he couldn't just sit in the attic waiting. He paced, he fidgeted, he chewed his fingernails. He came up with a plan. Chapter 26. Finally, finally a week and a half after the rally, a day dawned that was so clear and dry, Luke knew dad would be in the fields all day. Without hope, Luke turned on the light by the back door. After five minutes without a response, he turned it off and quietly slipped out the door. The cool air was a jolt, and for the briefest time, he paused. This was more dangerous than ever. But I have to know, he muttered fiercely and crept alongside the barn before making his dash for Jen's house. He had to rip the screen and break the pane of one of the Talbot's windows, which he felt bad about. But it didn't matter. If Jen was there, she could think of an excuse. And if she wasn't, if she wasn't, he'd never be back at the Talbots again. Once inside, he knew he had to do something about the alarm quickly. Jen had explained to him once, told him the exact sequence of buttons to hit to disable it. He ran to the hall closet, yanked open the door, and punched buttons quickly, afraid he'd forget the sequence if he hesitated even a second. Go at green, blue, yellow. 
Green, blue, orange, red. The, le the lights blinked out before he hit the last button, and that spooked him. Was that how it worked before? Hurry, hurry, he urged himself. The words kept replaying in his brain. Jen? Jen? He went up and down the stairs, looking in every room. Jen? You don't have to hide. It's me, Luke. The house was enormous, three floors and a basement. He couldn't search everywhere, but if Jen was there, why would she hide? Against reason, he kept hoping she was. Jen, come on, this isn't funny. He found the bedrooms, huge, elegant rooms with beautiful carved beds and long mirrored closets. He couldn't even tell which one was Jen's. Finally, he admitted defeat and rushed down to the computer room. He hurried over to the keyboard and typed in the same sequence of letters he watched and typed so many times. His fingers were clumsy and he kept messing up. Finally, he got to the chat room password. F-E-R-E, -E. no, erase, F-E-E-R, no, at least he got it. At last he got it, F-R-E-E. -E. The screen went blank with none of the friendly banter that had magically appeared every time he'd watched Jen. Had he done something wrong? Frantically, he exited and entered the chat room again, his hand still shaking, nothing. Timidly, using only his right index finger, he typed, where's Jen? He had to hold one hand with the other to steady his finger enough to hit the enter button. Almost instantaneously, his words vanished and reappeared at the top of the screen. He waited, nothing. The screen stayed blank below his question. Because nothing was worse than doing nothing. He typed again. Hello, is anybody there? Still nothing. He slammed his fist down on the computer desk so hard it hurt. I have to know. Tell me, I can't go home until I know. He shouted. He heard the door too late to react and suddenly a voice behind him, boomed behind him. Turn around slowly. I have a gun. Who are you and why are you here? Chapter 27. Luke stifled his instinct to run. He turned around as slowly as he could. Guns had been outlawed for everyone but government officials long before he was born. But he recognized that Audrey pointed at him from books and dad's descriptions. Dad had always talked about hunting rifles and shotguns, big guns to bring down deer or wolves. This gun was smaller, meant to kill humans. All that flashed through Luke's mind before he looked beyond the gun to the man holding it. He was tall and fleshy, his expensive clothes only partially hiding his bulk. Luke had seen him only from a distance before. You're Jen's dad, he said. I didn't ask who I was. Who are you? Luke exhaled slowly. A friend of Jen's, he said cautiously. Only because he was watching very, very closely did he see the man lower the gun by a fraction of an inch. Please, I just want to know where she is, Luke said. This time the man clearly relaxed his gun hand. He circled around behind Luke and snapped off the computer. Jen says you have to park the hard drive before you do that, Luke said. How do you know about Jen? The man asked. He narrowed his eyes. Luke blinked. The man was bargaining, he realized, offering to negotiate. He wanted something from Luke before he would tell Luke anything about Jen, but what? I'm a third child, too, Luke said finally. The man's expression didn't change, but Luke thought he saw a flicker of interest in his eyes. I'm a neighbor. I found out about her and I started coming over when I could. How did you know she was here, the man said. I saw, I saw lights when I knew everyone was gone. I guess... I, I really wanted there to be another third child for me to meet. So Jen was careless, the man said with an edge to his voice that Luke didn't understand. No, Luke said uncertainly. I was observant. The man nodded only to accept Luke's answer. Then he sat down in the chair by the computer desk and rested the gun on his leg. Luke took that as a sign that the conversation might last long enough for him to find out something. Did Jen teach you how to disable our alarm system? The man asked. Luke saw no point in lying. Yes, but I must have screwed up since you came. No, the man said. If you screwed up, the security guards would have come. But I have to set it, so I'm automatically notified if the system shut down while I'm away. Given the circumstances, I decided to investigate myself. 
Luke longed to ask what circumstances he meant. But the man was already asking another question. So, what else did you and Jen do together? The man said. Luke couldn't understand why he sounded so accusatory. Nothing. I mean, we talked a lot. She showed me the computer. She, she wanted me to go to the rally, but I was too scared. Too late. Luke thought to wonder if the man knew about the rally. Was Luke betraying Jan's confidence? But the man didn't seem surprised. He was studying Luke as intently as Luke had been studying him. Why didn't you stop her? The man asked. Stop Jen? That's like trying to stop the sun, Luke said. The man gave Luke the faintest of smiles, one that contained no happiness. Just remember that, he said. So where is she? Luke said, Luke asked. The man looked away. Jen's his voice broke. Jen is no longer with us. She, she's dead, the man said harshly. Somehow Luke had known without wanting to know. He still stumbled backwards in shock. He bumped into the couch and sagged into it. No, 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 not Jen, you're lying. His ears roared. He thought crazy things. This is a dream. A nightmare. I will make myself wake up. He remembered Jen talking a mile a minute, gesturing wildly. How could she be dead? He tried to picture her still lying, not moving. Dead? It was impossible. The man was shaking his head helplessly. I'd give anything to have her back, he whispered. But it's true. I saw they gave us, they gave us the body. Special privilege for a government official. His voice was so bitter. Luke could barely listen. And we couldn't even bury her in the family plot. Couldn't take a bereavement day off work. Couldn't tell anyone why we were going around with red eyes and aching hearts. No, we just had to pretend to be the same old family of four we'd always been. How? How did she die? Luke asked. He was thinking. If the car had wrecked, it wouldn't be so bad. Or maybe it had nothing to do with the rally. Maybe she just got really sick. They shot her, Jen's father said. They shot all of them, all 40 kids at the rally, gunned down right in front of the president's house. The blood flowed into his rose bushes, but they had the sidewalk scrubbed before the tourists came, so nobody would know. Luke started shaking his head no and couldn't stop. But Jen said there'd be too many people to shoot. She said there'd be a thousand. Luke protested as if Jen's words could change what he was hearing. Our Jen had too much faith and the bravery of her fellow hidden, Jen's father said. Luke flinched. I told her I couldn't go. I told her. It's not my fault. No, Jen said, quiet, Dad said quietly. And you couldn't have stopped her. It's not your fault. There are plenty of other people who deserve the blame. They probably would have shot a 1,000 or 15,000. They don't care. His face twisted. Luke thought he had never seen such pain, not even the time Matthew dropped a sledgehammer on his foot. Tears began to spill down Jen's father's face. What I don't understand is, why did she do this, this children's crusade? She wasn't stupid. We'd been warning her about the population police all her life. Did she really think the rally would work? He said, yes. Luke assured him. Then, unbidden, the last words she'd spoken to him came back to him. We can hope. After she told him, Hope was worthless. Maybe she knew the rally would fail. Maybe she even knew she would probably die. He remembered the first day he'd met her when she cut her hand to cover the drops of his blood on the carpet. There was something strange in Jen he couldn't quite understand that made her willing to sacrifice herself to help others or to try to. I think at first she thought the rally would work, Luke told Jen's dad. And then even when she wasn't sure, she still had to go. She wouldn't call it off. Why? Jen's dad asked. He was sobbing. Did she want to die? No, Luke said. She wanted to live. Not die. Not hide. Live. The words played over and over again in his brain. Not hide. Live. Not hide. Live. As long as he held on to them, he felt like Jen was there. She just left the room for a minute to get more potato chips, maybe, and soon she'd be back to lecture him again about how they both deserved a better life than hiding. 
He could believe it was her voice echoing in his ears. But if he let go, let the words stop for a minute, he was lost. He felt like the whole world was spinning away from him, and he was all alone. He wanted to cry out, Jen, come back, as if she could hear him and stop the spinning and come to him. As if from a great distance, Luke heard Jen's father heave and sigh and blow his nose in a businesslike way. You may not be ready to hear this, he said, but dizzily, Luke raised his head and listened half-heartedly. When you logged into that chat room, a buzzer went off in a room in a population police headquarters. They're monitoring the chat room very closely. They found it after the rally. I've managed to uh, cover things up about Jen, but they'll trace your message back to our computer. The population police are backlogged right now, following leads from the rally, so I should have a day or two to come up with a plausible sounding explanation. But if they investigate too carefully, you may be in danger. More than usual, Luke said sarcastically. Jen's dad took the question seriously. Yes, they will begin actively looking for you. They'll search every house around this one. It wouldn't take them long to find you. A chill ran down Luke's spine. So he would die, just like Jen. Or not like her, she had gone bravely. He would be caught like a mouse in its hole. But if you'll let me, Jen's dad continued, I can get you a fake ID. You can be miles away before they come looking. You would do that for me? Why? Because of Jen. But how? I have connections. You see, Jen's dad hesitated. I work for the population police. <laughs>